Hello, everybody. Glad you're here to join us on It Has Nothing to Do with Age or Gender. You like the music? Tony added the music. Unfortunately, Tony is not here today. He's still vacationing. But he'll be, he'll be with us shortly. Um, I am very pleased today for a number of reasons. But one is I have a very special friend, Jerome Beauchamp, that I'm going to introduce to you today, who's on our program, who will talk about numerous things. So not only are you going to be inspired from being mentally tough, but also he's going to add something about the physical capabilities. And so we're going to get into that. But first, um, to introduce Jerome, I met Jerome back in the 90s. It was the late 90s. And he's not even, at that point, 40. He's, he's in his late 30s in the 90s. And I met him on the trail in San Jose at the Quicksilver Ride and Tie. And I can picture it today. It's not that long ago. Anyway, there's a vet check at about 10 to 11 miles, and then you do another 11 miles or so. And Jerome's on his horse. I don't remember the name of the horse, but he's walking because his horse lost a shoe. Tango. 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 There you go. Tango lost, lost a shoe. And so I suggest to Jerome that I said, hey, Jerome, I don't have an easy boot to uh, provide, to give you, to, you know, to help your horse. So I would suggest that you walk. Well, his brother Robert, a couple years older, in his 40s, he's running. Robert can handle it, believe me. Robert can handle it. Because Robert's an extreme athlete as well. Uh, just a little bit about Jerome. Jerome has done the um, Dan Barger's Echo Series. He's done California Ironman, triathlons. And he also biked across the United States as a high school kid in his teens. And he showed up today on a bike, one speed. So anyway, Jerome has... Has has many many stories, but so Jerome, this is a this is a program on mental toughness, and I usually start the program. Usually, I start it every time with a quote, and the quote is not only for you to talk about mental toughness, but also to talk about this quote and how it relates to your life. Okay. So this is by John Muir, and I know you'd appreciate John Muir. The power of imagination makes us infinite. That's it. So how does that quote relate to you in your, he's, he's turning 50 shortly, so anyway. So tell us, Jerome. Well, first I'd like to say thanks for inviting me. You're welcome. Yeah. It's, it's my pleasure to see you again. Yeah, it's been a while, and it's a real pleasure to be with you. And I appreciate that you felt that I was qualified and appropriate here. This is wonderful. Qualified? <laughs> you, you are more than qualified. Jerome has been with me and helped me through Western States. He was one of my pacers for Western States, through the Tevis Cup. We have a lot of stories. There was one story that maybe Jerome will get into. It was, we did a ride and tie world championship. Jerome refers to it as the ride from hell. <laughs> it was on Bob Edwards horse G. Oh yes, uh, so, up at your valley. So, there, <laughs> <laughs> so you are more than qualified, let me tell you. Yeah. You're so humble. The power of imagination makes, makes a, us infinite. In, right. Wow. Well, that's pretty appropriate. I would think that, in my mind, um, imagination has certainly made me feel infinite, and, uh, and reality oftentimes brings that back into perspective. So 
Tell us the about ba the balance. Tell us, tell the us balance about it. between infinity and uh, reality is uh, somewhat sobering, but also quite exhilarating. It, uh, the, the infinite possibilities of what we can do seems to be a driving factor in wanting to try, always wanting to try something more, regardless of what the feat. And it's, uh, I think in the younger years, I actually, younger year, you're still you're <laughs> younger years. Come on, Jerome. Well, I don't know. Be, it's uh, being a grandparent at this point in the ball game, and and coming into my my fiftieth year, I've I've kind of felt I just went from being a boy to being something other than a boy. Maybe something that actually garners some respect by virtue of age, and not necessarily experience. So I see you as a boy. Coming I see you as a boy. <laughs> Good. It was, uh, Still. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, imagination, um, it ebbs and flows. I at some points in life, imagination might not be as present, and, and living, living with the realities of day-to-day -day can, can keep someone away from that feeling of infinity or the essence of the infinite. It's, a, it's an interesting quote. I think we could chat about that for quite some time. Because um, your life certainly in parts deals with imagination. Oh, most definitely, most definitely. Sometimes, I don't know if I'd consider it a real creative imagination at this point. Doesn't but, matter. Uh, yeah, I guess, matter. I guess that's irrelevant. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. And tell us a little bit about mental toughness. What would be your definition? Well, I don't know about the definition as much as I could maybe share some stories around what it means. Okay, um, That's, that'd be fine too. Mental toughness, toughness defined, I guess, would have to do with, with some, fo some form of perseverance and diligence and dedication and fortitude, these types of things, and also a certain amount of resilience. You've in, done that. In, in, in different aspects, most certainly. Um, and mental toughness could also have a certain gentle aspect to it, I guess, would be the, the dynamic of its survivability. One, one may not always be able to practice toughness mentally, and, and maybe one of the more underlying subtle realities is, is that just simply allowing one to be in and of itself and recognizing that that's an element of it, not always needing to be tough, right? And I think for me, for many, many years, I felt a need to do something more, need to be tougher, than, need to be stronger than, I don't know, than, than whatever it was that I imaginatively created as the infinity. Well, you have two older brothers. I have older brothers and an older sister and, uh, you know, certainly extended family and other people. So that how I, might that contribute? Well, that's an interesting question because uh, I went through some personal work uh, three years ago and it was it was a it was an environment of personal development where the the facilitators worked to try to find that that seminal moment in one's early years uh, that helped to form them. Like it was perhaps defined as the the moment the moment that the that the innocent young person four or five six years old seven years old had a moment that changed life and. Interestingly, the, what I recalled in that moment at that time, what came up for me was when my oldest brother, who was nine years older than me, so say if I was seven, he was 16, he would hold me down and, uh, and tease me. You know, I think I probably used the words torture. <laughs> and, and I couldn't get Older up. Older brothers can do that. I, I couldn't get up. I was somewhat helpless. And, and, uh, and in that moment, through this several days of a workshop, it, it might have set something in motion that would suggest that I was, would always be bigger than I really was, be stronger, faster, smarter, taller, stronger, in order to not have that happen again. And, and that, it was interesting because the way that whole process came about, some of the things that I've done in my life would be, it could be looked at as, as me being bigger or more than I really am, or me being more than I was or thought I was, or the perception of it. Okay. And, and uh, it wasn't uncommon that I would embellish things, not necessarily lie, but embellish things that would, have, would occur in my own mind, and even when I went and carried out events. Or when I would, so for instance, when I'm 40 years old, 
a friend of mine and I were looking at each other. I was 189 pounds. Right now I'm 155, and I think my prime weight's right around 160, 165. I realized I was kind of fat and slothing, and um, I went, uh, actually, I guess we could tell stories, right? Sure. So this brings up all kinds of funny stories. It was uh, my oldest daughter, who's now uh, 24, and... Um, Caitlin, she has our granddaughter Hazel, um, beautiful, beautiful gals. She was, I think, in the, I want to say the sixth grade and around there. Mm -hmm. And I went down to Lake Folsom. We were on a bike ride. I went to Lake Folsom and I was with uh, Stephen Casperite, who was the games teacher at the Waldorf School at the time. And we did a bicycle ride and we were done. And he said, Well, we're all going swimming. Then I was like, Well, I don't, I don't have a swimsuit. And he says, oh, I have an extra one. Now, now Stephen is a 220 pounds, but quite chiseled and, and a long distance swimmer. Mm -hmm. And so he threw me a Speedo. But you're a good swimmer. I have always been a relatively good swimmer, yeah. But, this, but the interesting thing is, is Caitlin saw that I was gonna put a Speedo on in front of her class and she immediately went to tears. So wow. I, walked out of, I walked out of this little bathroom over there at Folsom Lake and to the to the awe of the other students uh i wasn't in that attractive of shape i guess you might add so anyway i went on a swim with steven and that this dynamic of embellishing i the next morning i hadn't swam or ran or biked for 10 years before that not a thing back in the days i was running marathons in college and uh we went swimming the next day and i swam 2500 yards hadn't swam for 10 years in a master's program. And then about a week later, I called Stephen and I was said, I saw on the internet that there's, there's an Ironman triathlon next year in Folsom. And I said, what do you think about us doing the Ironman? And much to my amazement, chagrin, surprise, he said, absolutely. <laughs> so that's an example of, you know, I could have simply gotten off the couch and gone for a jog or gone to the gym and started lifting weights or you know running the treadmill but but no but that, that's that wasn't the way jerome works that's jerome, an interesting goal yeah jerome goes for what you know many may consider the, the pinnacle the certainly yeah, extreme yeah, in yeah. most respects yeah. and and uh when i when i would throw a party it wouldn't be a party for 10 or 20 it would be the love fest with 300 people in 16 bands so i realized when when i was in this personal development workshop that I look back on my life about how I operated over the previous 25 years and much of what I achieved, much of what I had done may have very well been influenced by that seminal moment or moments like it that formed me being, reaching for certain things. And that hadn't, that wasn't necessarily the only time. Oh no. I forget your older brother's name. Arthur. Arthur. Arthur did that to you. It wasn't the only time. So to compete, and feel not vulnerable right. and weak within your family structure. Yeah. That's a good way to uh, react. Oh yeah. Well, and you, uh, yeah, through your through your experience and your career, I would imagine you could well, well. I understand it. Yeah, and intellectually relate. understand and that and absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah, I mean that that actually went from from then on. My older brothers were always well, certainly much bigger and older, so much more capable, and just to keep up or. Perform well, he, both school-wise, work-wise, socially. I never saw Arthur as the athlete, but certainly Robert, in terms of yeah. competition with Robert, because he's essentially the same yeah. size. You're both look the right. same size. He's not that much older, but he's older. Robert's five years older than I am. It's, they, they, pe most people think they're both younger than I am, but. Arthur in the early years was a very accomplished swimmer, oh, cross he country. Okay. He ran cross country in college. He he was his own formidable athlete, in, okay. you know, er, earlier in his in his years. So you have that history of of competition. Oh, oh and, yeah. and excellence. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I started swimming when I was four years old, you know, competitively and competitively. You know, sure. At four. Sure. Is that whose idea was that? Probably my brothers, your brother, and my as parents. Opposed? They they all swam on the Travis Flyers, Travis Air Force Base, Travis Flyers. I think was the your name. Your father was in the military. Yeah, we were there. He was stationed at Travis for nine years. So I spent 
from 6 to 15 on that Air Force Base. Okay. And uh, started swimming, compet swimming, skiing, all these things early. And I was, you know, my brothers, again, they're so much older than me, they would bring me along. So I, I had, well, my first experience that I remember snow skiing was we went up to Sugar Bowl. We were up uh, going up the Crow's Nest chairlift, which was a hard, the black diamonds. I'm, I don't know what I'm, I'm four years old. My brother's 13. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I, he, I said, I can't do this. He says, oh, yeah, you can. He says, just keep up. Just keep up. Just keep up. So I, I would ski as hard as I could, and I'd fall. Yeah. I was falling continually, and they're just skiing down. And I learned how to fall, keep my eye on them, get back up, and start skiing again without ever stopping. And I just would pray well, that well, my ski wouldn't fall off. What's the alternative? Being up on a mountain? I would be alone. You'd be alone. And I guess yeah. it would have been nice, actually, if I had realized then I could have just sat there and not worried about a thing and just been alone and gone at my own pace. Well, but this is just another example of how some of these early not at four formative or five. experiences, well, who knows where the, where the road would have turned if I chose that, being a little bit more, who knows? Philosophical, yeah. That's Self-confident. That or Well, but at four or five. I don't know. Okay, we'll give you a break. That, sure. That it's understandable that sure. you wanted to get up and sure. keep up with your older brothers. But I definitely. Because that's what they told you to do. Oh, most well, definitely, yeah. It's like we're, we're not we're not waiting for you. We're not going to stop for yeah. you. Yeah. That's I remember. I'm pretty certain that they kept an eye on me, and they probably always they knew. They looked over their yeah, shoulder? Yeah, they probably always knew where Jerome was up the hill. He's on his way. He'll, he'll, yeah. he'll get up to us. Did they wait for you down at the bottom? I, I recollect. You sure. don't remember the It didn't part. take me long to learn how to ski fast enough to keep up with them, though. Oh, so you were you. able to keep up with them. Oh, it, it didn't take long, for sure. I would just go straight down the hill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did I mean, you get I, better than them at skiing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, you did? oh, very much so. That'll teach them. And swimming and other things. So you, I know you're a really great swimmer. So you outperformed your older brother swimming as well. Oh, yeah. I th yeah. Yeah. Neat. There were some things that they were better than I was. Like you know, what? Maybe just naturally. Running. I've never well, been, Robert, as you know, Robert, Robert. I've never been that fast a runner. But you're a good runner. I, I was steady. Yeah. Yeah. I could run for quite a while. You did? Yeah. Other than running? Yeah. Because you did the, the Echo Challenge series, and so you had yeah. to do different events for that. Bike, I know you're really a great biker, or at least you, you were very competitive with the biking. Yeah. I've never been competitive in the essence of better than most people. I'm, I've never been the fastest, really, or, okay. or in, in the okay. highest echelon. Okay. But I've always been somewhat formidable, somewhat accomplished, I guess. Maybe. You were how old when you went across the biking, you and Robert went uh, I was 17 years old. It was the day after I graduated from high school. It was a Jesuit school, wasn't it? I graduated from Jesuit in Sacramento. In Sacramento. Yeah. yeah, 1981. So tell us, before we get into the, the healthy yeah, foods that you're come, doing, yeah. but how did, how did that Come about. Here you are graduating. Robert is is uh, he in college at this particular point? Robert is at Humboldt State University. He's at Humboldt I State. He okay. He might have graduated, but I don't think so. I think that might have been his last year. We were. It was sometime around Christmas, and we were talking. Now, three years earlier, Arthur and Robert rode across the country from Wisconsin to Davis. So when Robert was eighteen or nineteen. Arthur, who was then 20, 21, rode from Menasha, Wisconsin to Davis okay. on their Schwinn Super Sports. Schwinn Super yeah. Sports. And I was, so at that point, I was, must have been 13. Okay. And, and I was there when they rode up. So fast forward a couple of years, Robert and I are talking, and he says, well, you know, I, I would like to do that again. And, you know, he offered up that he would, he would then do what Arthur did and take, take me across take the country. Take you across, okay. Yeah, so we, we each bought a Univega Gran Turismo, which at the time was, was the touring bike, the first, maybe first ever 18 speed on the market with three, three sprockets in the front and what would that be, five in the back, you know, six in the back, 18 six speeds. And we rode, I recall maybe riding six or seven times 
in March, April, May. Building up? Well, you could call it that. I mean, we went on a couple 30 miles rides. I think we went on one 50 mile ride. That's not a whole lot of build up. No, it really wasn't. And we, we, uh, we packed everything up in a little Toyota pickup truck and drove up to uh, Ocean City, Washington, out um, on the Olympic Peninsula. And on June, it must have been June 22nd, if I recall, something like this. It was literally a few days after I graduated from high school. First day of summer, like. Yeah. And uh, we got there early in the morning. We walked out and we walked in the ocean. The idea was to walk in each ocean. Okay. So okay. we walked in the ocean, and, and I remember the gentleman that dropped us off, he drove away. <laughs> We kind of look at each other and like, really? <laughs> <laughs> really, we're going to do this. We had panniers on the front of the bike, panniers on the back of the bike, fully loaded down, skid lids, the old skid lid helmet. And uh, we walked our bikes up the shore, right from the beach up to the road, got on them and started riding. Started riding. And we, we probably covered 60 miles that day and through the Olympic Peninsula and took a ferry across into some area just south of Seattle and started riding north of Spokane yeah, and then went up uh, Highway 20, I think it was there, Highway 20 or Highway 2, went up to Washington Pass, Rainy Pass. It was 95 miles of uphill of like 5% grade. -ish. That's enough. It was. That's enough. It was, we, we were, this was not at all acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, I remember Robert's knees. It was like the third day Robert's knee started hurting. And I'm thinking, wow, this uh -oh. is interesting. So he, he actually put a bungee cord from his bike to my bike and had me pull him, assisted. Really? Yeah, to the, to the, to the campsite that we were going to. And I was thinking, so my, it was, I don't, it was, I have it no was hurting. It was hurting. Then yeah, and, and uh, we were going through calluses on our, you know, we were three days. And uh, I remember when we got to the top of, Washington Pass or Rainy Pass, I'm not remembering which one, but it was an, we proceeded the coast for 18.6 miles without pedaling. <laughs> that helped was, the knees. It was down the other side going 60 miles an hour, passing cars, full panniers. It was a real treat. Wow. Yeah. That had to be scary. If I remember, there were like five mountain passes going east just in the state of Washington. We ended up riding 107 miles a day average for 33 days. It's a lot of miles. A lot of miles. Yeah. I think we did 159 miles in North Dakota. It was our long day of the, of the trip. That's fast. Yeah. Yeah, we went back to our uh, family reunion, Wilbraham, Massachusetts. Is that? We got there the day before the reunion, so we timed it pretty well. And then after that, we, we, the next day, we rode to Boston. All right. Yeah, we finished in Boston. Classic. Yeah. Got in an airplane and flew back and went to college. <laughs> <laughs> that was my summer. That was your the summer. summer of 81. What stands out from that ride? Oh, my gosh. I guess just doing it uh, is, is one thing, just to have done it. Um, I would think that actually doing it wasn't really that big a deal, but but to to do that event, the day to day to day to Every day, day was Every was day. really just kind of like, hey, we're waking up, we're getting on the bikes and we're riding. We got to the point where we'd stop at lunch at a supermarket, we'd each get a half a gallon of ice cream and eat it, right there at lunch in one sitting, and then we'd ride and we we just did whatever. We camped out on the side of the road stayed in churches, a lot of churches. That's a great place to stay, by the way. If you're ever traveling and you need a place to stay, go to a local church and normally the rectory or someone will be there and, and mm -hmm. they're always accommodating. They were always very accommodating. But there were many events that occurred on that ride that, that were interesting. You had to meet a lot of people on the we way. We met a number of people, not that many. You might meet people for a moment or two. Okay. But you really don't spend, there were times when we would spend the evening with people when we were ready to camp. And people would come out and they'd stop and they'd look and what are you doing? And some people would run us off. What are you doing? You have to get off this property. You can't be here. And we're like, well, we're kind of, we just got done with the 120 mile ride and we're 
we're going to be riding tomorrow morning. And, oh, what are you doing? Well, we're riding across the United States. So how old are you? I'm 17. 17. Well, why don't you come over and have dinner with us? <laughs> That's how it changed. Yeah. And, and you know, many times, actually, people were, what are you doing here? You can't, you can't sleep here. This is private property. We're like, oh, well, we didn't really know the difference. It just looked like a nice meadow or a nice place to sleep. And almost inevitably, if we stayed more than five minutes, you know, we were then taken care of. You know, people went from being protective of their space to offering up their hospitality once they understood the parameters of it. And there were obviously some people too that would walk right up and, hey, what are you doing? And uh, yeah. I remember we were at a McDonald's. McDonald's? Gosh, it's harsh to say with this superfood. <laughs> it was a long time ago, back in the days of McDonald's in Albany, New York, and we were we were in line. We were getting our Big Mac or whatever. <laughs> Actually, our four Big Macs. I'm four, sure. Four Big Macs, right? And uh, we were um, ordering, and we're getting our food, and and we went and sat down, and the a gentleman walked up, and he says, "Well, I couldn't I couldn't help but overhear your conversation with your brother, and 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 I understand you're on a bike trip, and turns out he was maybe the dean of." the university in Albany. I don't know what university is in Albany, New York, but it's a, uh, um, so he invited us over to his home and he ordered up pizza and uh, beer, if I remember. Um, and we sat and ate pizza and talked to him at his nice house there and uh, just things like that. It was, it was fantastic. Great experience oh, for yeah. a 17 year old. Unbelievable. On the road. On, on the, the road. road. No on cell phones, right? No. That was before cell right? phones. Yeah, we have to stop at the pay phone every few days and call. Were, call you, check it, were you checking in? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No. Not a lot. Weekly. Weekly? Yeah. Is how many weeks well, did it take? How, how, how many thinking. weeks did it take? Well, it was 44 total days, 33 44 days, days okay. of riding. 11, we took 10 day, 11 days throughout the trip where we took a day off here or there and did different things. So, talk about the bonding experience with Robert on that trip. Oh, that certainly set the stage for a lifelong relationship. Not that we weren't, well, actually, the reality is, is my brothers went off to college. I was still in you're elementary still at, school you're at home. when they were off to college. So, interestingly, now that I remember, I didn't have much of a, an adult relationship with my brothers. They, they were gone. So, my oldest brother was gone, right, 12th grade. I was yeah. in third grade. You know, my other brother left when I was in sixth grade or seventh grade. So Robert and I obviously spent a lot of time together on that trip, and, and we've always had a pretty special bond from that. Actually, we went on to do many other sporting events together, right? Yeah, you did the Echo Series with yeah, him. Yeah, that, that was inspired by him. He had, he had competed in the Eco Challenge in Borneo. He did the Southern Traverse in New Zealand. He did the Raid Galois in France. He did the... Primal Quest out here. He, those were the big time eco races. Well, he was really into it. Yeah, yeah, he was quite accomplished. And he, through that, uh, he introduced me to the eco challenge here that Dan Barger put on. That was a short one. That was only a 25, that took us 25 hours and 25 minutes. Short one that compared was a, to That yeah. was a short one, yeah. Yeah, yeah that was a 50 mile mountain bike ride and then a, maybe a six mile run and then an 18 mile paddle and then an 18 mile run all around here, right? Any part that was challenging or difficult for you? Oh, that whole thing. The whole, <laughs> the whole, the whole thing? <laughs> no, it started at midnight in Forest Hill. And so the first, the first was at midnight down Yankee Gyms to the, what, the Middle Fork or North Fork of the American and then That's up. That's on a bike? On a mountain bike. On a mountain bike. And then up to Colfax, back down Paradise, back down to the river. So it's what, 1,800 feet down, 1,800 feet up, 1,800 feet down. And then you had to trek through the river. Dan had set up this course. You had to trek through the river carrying your bike for the better part of four miles. Across the American River? Yeah, down in, through the American River because you had to go down river. And then we pushed our bicycle back up the north or the south face of the canyon Right, no, no, no road. No, this is just sing no trails. I mean, you had to go right up to Driver's Flat. Okay. And then from Driver's Flat, we rode the trail, the connector loop trail into Auburn, to the Overlook, and then we got off our bikes there and ran down to the confluence, Cofferdam, got in a kayak or a canoe, not even a, a, a blow up, 
canoe. Inflatable. Inflatable, and then paddled to Did you have to carry the, the inflatable, or was that there? That was there. That was we there. only had to carry it like a half a mile okay. down to the put-in. Okay. And then we paddled down to Granite Bay, and then ran from Granite Bay back to the Overlook in Auburn. That's we, a good run. We started that, at midnight, a, a and we run. finished at 12.25 a.m. 24 hours yeah. in 25 minutes. Yeah. It might have been finished at 1.25, because I remember 25 hours, 25 minutes, but okay. who knows? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that was where I had my first real uh, bonking experience. Where'd you, is, where'd you bonk? Right? They, they call it the wall in the marathon, but in right. the bigger races, they call it bonking. I where'd guess. you bonk? I bonked at mile 42 on the uh, on the sta on the trail on the American River Trail. So what would that running be? Running back. Running back up at Horseshoe Bar. Oh, right around where you used to live. Uh, yeah, there. I used to live right there. Yeah. So I, I bonked at Horseshoe Bar, and my son Pierre, who was maybe five years old at the time, wanted. He's like, "Come on, Dad!" He brought his backpack. He was ready to run with us, and and luckily Robert had was in that same race with his group, but he had finished six hours before. I mean, this is how. You know, Robert, Robert's team came in second well, place. Well, he's experienced. And so he was down there, and I couldn't get out of my chair. I sat down there. at a checkpoint, and I was done. I really had a difficulty standing. I couldn't eat, wasn't interested in eating. And luckily, he was there because he knew exactly what was going on. So he, he force-fed me. That's what he did, yeah. 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 And he said, you got to stand up, you got to walk, and you got to eat, and you got to drink. And, and he just kept feeding me. And sure enough, inside of eight, ten minutes, Things started moving, and he loaded me up with food, and our team went off, and I walked for another mile, and then sure enough, it all comes back, and we ended up running. And then one of my partners bonked two miles before cardiac. Okay. And uh, and that was a little bit uglier because no one was around. It was 11:30 at cardiac, night. And cardiac. And cardiac. That's and tough. There was no that's moon. Tough uh, Dan Barger again plans these things. I don't think there was a moon that time. Dark, really dark. You, you can hallucinate pretty vividly being totally sober after you've been running for 25 hours. The, the well, hallucinations yeah. Oh, yeah. become, the, oh, yeah. the bushes actually can grab you. Well, yeah. And you can physically feel them grabbing you. It's pretty frightful. Well, he, he went down and he, he lay down and he passed out. Okay. And uh, I thought I was pretty scared at that because I, you know, I didn't know. And uh, luckily, we were like the third to last team at that point. Luckily, there was a team not far behind us that came up, and luckily he was competitive enough. Um, Rick, he was competitive enough that he didn't want that team to pass us, so he somehow gained some okay. consciousness, and we walked and trudged up cardiac. cardiac. Okay. And uh, he ended up having intravenous. He he immediately received intravenous support when he when we finished. He did more than bonk. Yeah, he was yeah. he was in questionable condition. Yeah. He went on after that. That was, he, that was his introduction to adventure racing. He went on to compete in several full-length eco-challenges okay. and international races. Yeah, Rick Bertese. So that was pretty interesting. We had Dan on, I think it was right after Western States. Ran, Dan ran Western States again this year. And so I met him. Um, at the uh, recycling center, the 16 mile marker on the trail. Mm -hmm. I look over and it's Dan Barger. So we start talking and said, yeah, come on the, on the show. So we had him on the show. My first um, ride and tie experience was meeting Dan. Dan put on the Mustang Classic in San Jose. It was an endurance ride and a ride and tie. And that's how I got introduced to, to Ride and Tie through the endurance ride in 1997. So, And that's about when we met. It was right after that. Could have been 98 or 99. And Frank and I went on to be a somewhat, somewhat infamous team for several years. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat infamous team. Uh, Not a whole lot of arguing. Some here and there. But I, 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 I always can remember that, that I don't know if this came from you or another one of my teammates was if anyone out there is, is familiar with ride and tie. Um, after you've been running, there are times when, when you could run for 
Normally it's maybe two, three miles at a clip, maybe less, maybe six miles. Sometimes it's planned. I don't know. The major runners can plan on running 10 miles at a time or 15 or whatever. Most of us go sure. a couple miles at a clip. And the last thing one wants to hear after they've run longer, like say for instance we've done six miles, and, and it gets on these single track trails with heavy elevation gain and loss, one does not want to hear when they when the partner comes up with the horse, that the partner says, tie the horse in two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, make it a short tie, make please. It, okay. and I'm thinking, how does, how does that work? How did I just run for 50 minutes? And I got to run and more. Then I get, and then the horse shows up, and now I get two minutes on the horse. I was like, how does that Part did, of the I, did I say more. that to you? I don't know. I think that might have I been could've. my wife I that could've. said that. But. I thought you were going to, well, it might have been Mary, because I thought that, um, well, there was one time, one of our last, might have been our last ride and tie together, was at um, Drew Barner. Yeah. And. Oh, and by I, the way, let me just preface that with Mary and I, my wife and I did a ride and tie, 36 miles, where she was my partner, and we ran and rode for 36 miles. It was pretty exciting. She probably did most of the riding. I think she did more riding, but yeah. we've had this discussion over and over again. But, uh, but let's just say that I'm, I'm really pleased to say that we did a ride did tie together, you a 36-miler. The championship. Yeah. That was the championship. And we finished, and it was great. Yeah. Well, I think our last ride and tie was that, um, at Drew Barner. And I had Gypsy, and for some reason, got distracted, and I ran by Gypsy. And it wasn't until much later uh, yes, I remember. that I had to go, I found, finally found out that, that, that Jerome didn't have, that you didn't have my horse. My horse was still tied, I had to go back. And I eventually caught up to you. So you did a lot of running that day, I remember. I remember that. And you were tired. Yeah, I you think that tired. might have been a 10 or 12 mile stint or more. You, there was a, you did a long, because I didn't catch you till after we went through the, uh, campground on the other side of the, yeah. of the, of the road. Okay. Um, we could talk, we only have an hour show, so. Okay. Um, I wanted, uh, is there, there were many roads that you took between in the 90s, 2000, these different events, to Bright Earth Foods. Yeah. Um, and can you tell us a little bit about how that, because I think that's an interesting story too in terms of how you got connected with with your uh, company. Yeah, the uh, Bright Earth Foods has been a journey, um, very enlightening, um, sometimes challenging, but very rewarding journey. I, I, was in, I was in real estate, corporate real estate management for many years. Big 20, time. 20, 25 big, years. Big time. We did some big projects there. Um, and uh, I had gone through a midlife crisis. I had, for all intents and purposes, for different reasons, lost my career, lost my income, and uh, really started to question myself and doubt myself and, and loathe myself in many respects, not, not being capable enough. Not not being able to maintain that level of capability that I was given, you're that six year old adopted. Kid, that's that right. Six-year-old kid adopted again. at such an early age, and yeah. and it's no, there's no doubt that by living into that for so many years and then hitting a wall, the wall of life, perhaps, um, when I wasn't able to earn the income, I wasn't able to take care of the family, I wasn't able to do the things I did either mentally or in reality. And it weighed heavily on me. It, it weighed very, very heavily on me to the point where I, I believe that I went insane for a period of time, lost my stability for sure mentally, um, physically began to deteriorate to some degree. And um, there, there were a couple of very dark months. Um, and, and, and not long before that, I had wondered, oh, well, someday I'm an opening of some sort. I, I don't know what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, this gentleman shows up at my home one day, and uh, my wife um, was involved in superfoods and natural, natural foods, and she's been involved the, all the while. Natural foods, organic foods, holistic living, natural childbirth, nursing. She carried the family when it comes to our 
health and wellness. Mm -hmm. um, I might have carried the family with respect to work and income in these things. And she, she was the glue that kept us founded um, in the base of good health. And while I was going through this transition of mine, she got more and more into superfoods. Well, one day the gentleman who, who founded Bright Earth Foods showed up on our doorstep. How did Auburn. that happen? He was there to visit a young woman, uh, Uma Friedland, who was staying with us. And um, Anderon Martel showed up. He was, he was off in Peru. Um, he owned a superfood company. So I had this vision of this gentleman who owns a food company, lives in Peru, and I had a story made up about you know him living on the side of a mountain and and he shows up and and uh, I relate to him my experience and that I was actually on antidepressant drugs at that point first time in my life I'd ever been on a pharmaceutical prescription and he immediately said you should drink noni juice and eat blue green algae from Klamath Lake and that's gonna stimulate your pineal gland and 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 help the serotonin levels in your brain and that's what's gonna that's what's gonna stabilize you these drugs are gonna kill you mm -hmm. and you need to get off the drugs mm -hmm. right now and I was not in a place to really contemplate that um, uh, and uh, but over the next couple of weeks I called him back up and said, what was that stuff I was supposed to take? And then a couple weeks later, what was that I was supposed to take? I couldn't mm -hmm. even remember. But finally, mm -hmm. sure enough, I started drinking noni juice and sprinkling it with Klamath uh, Lake blue-green algae. And uh, within a couple of weeks... What kind weeks, of juice? Noni. It's raw noni juice from the Tahitian noni fruit, which is a stimulating, oxidative, alkalizing liquid, an elixir. It's a juice, a pure juice. Mm -hmm. Between those two, they have a positive beneficial effect on the neuro functioning of the brain. It can reactivate. Neurotransmitters. Yeah, it, it can help. In my instance, I believe that it, it did a significant amount to stabilize and re-energize my brain functionality. And I would imagine some of the other, some of the antidepressant drugs and things that I was on probably had their effect. And as I was also doing some um, homeopathic treatments at the time. So through a series of events I started waking up again and when I woke up my wife and I uh, Mary showed an interest in being a rep for Bright Earth Foods and so we started repping the foods and it was only in short order that we started selling a lot of food and learning more about it and incorporating it more and more into our diet and then a couple months later I invested a little bit of money into the company to buy more noni juice interestingly enough okay and I don't, I don't think that's exactly where the money went at the time, but that was, that was the premise. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Anderon asked me if I wanted to get, I started asking more questions once I became financially involved and found that the inner workings of the company maybe might not, weren't, weren't as efficient as they could have been. And then Anderon asked me to get more involved at a management level. And I went up to Ashland and my first introduction to the to the employees up in Ashland. Is that corporate office? Ashland, Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Anderon mentioned to everybody that he was moving to Peru and that Jerome would be taking over management of the company, much to the surprise of all the employees there that I had never met before. Um, so that kind of embarked me on the next path. And uh, It had to be challenging. It was, it was quite challenging. Yeah, I mean, I was coming out of, of a pretty significant acute depression and coming into a whole new career, losing a career in real estate, somewhat out of choice, but also somewhat out of circumstances of the 2005, yeah. five, six, seven, eight yeah. real estate reality. And um, yeah, it was challenging because I, I was really questioned whether I had the skill to, to manage a company. And mind you, a company that was losing $10,000 a month at the time that was pretty much out of money that needed to make some real structural changes. And uh, uh, things lined up. We met we met a gentleman and his wife Bharat Mitra and Bhavani Lev that own Organic India, which is a, a tea company out of India. And uh, I met them through a strange twist of events where a woman that lived on our property was in Portugal and met Bharat's brother and Bharat, she told him that Bharat was looking for superfoods and somehow, some way, the phone call got to me. And several months later, Bharat invested some money in the company and we used that to stay alive, and we restructured the ownership dynamic. I became the CEO of a company with three employees, and uh, 
one step at a time through the efforts of many people and people have come and gone and come and gone and now we have uh, 11 employees and we're profitable after four years and we have 24 different products and we're coming out with several more we're in hundreds of stores we're opening up accounts nationwide you know there's there's a there was a there was a question in my mind for two solid years i didn't get paid for two years i, I was doing this without pay okay for the better part of two years maybe more and uh there was question whether i was gonna i was running out of money i, I didn't all the money i had saved i was in the process of running through and so we moved out of our home in Christian Valley. We downsized. The Beauchamp family rejiggered their lifestyles considerably. We stopped making payments on our home and went into that whole default process. And one thing kept leading to another. We kept focused on Bright Earth Foods. And, and now Bright Earth Foods is paying everybody that's involved. And we're profitable. And we just doubled the size of our warehouse up in Ashland. We have 7,000 square feet in Ashland, Oregon now. And Anderon is happily growing another company down in Peru and chasing down new products and we have another partner in Thailand that's chasing down new products and my wife is involved Mary is now involved in the company and getting our website ready to go and we have our general manager and our crew up in Ashland and so we represent superfoods what are superfoods tell super everybody foods, superfoods is becoming uh, a more often used term but in its purest sense I'd like to say that a superfood is a raw unprocessed food that comes straight from Mother Earth and that you consume in its highest and most nutritious quality state. How do you get that? Well, in, in some respects, you can go pick some broccoli and eat broccoli. That's a superfood, okay. right? So I consider organic vegetables superfoods. The superfoods that we focus on are uh, maca powder, cacao powder, acai powder, Camu Camu Maybe powder. Maybe you can so, educate. Yeah, these the are audience. these are um, these are foods that have been around for millennia. Most of them, blue green algae, has been around for thousands and thousands of years. That's pretty popular. Chlorella is is a single cell uh, single celled algae with a broken cell wall. That's perhaps the oldest food on the planet, and it's now a superfood. Super high in protein. So superfoods generally are very very highly nutritious, very nutrient dense, high in vitamins, high in minerals. So for instance, Camu Camu, uh, I understand is 20 times, has 20 times more vitamin C than the same amount of orange, right? Okay. An acai berry is like a blueberry. It's very high in antioxidants. Um, so maca powder, because it's grown high in the Andes, it, it's grown in very rigorous environments. The powder of the maca root is very fortifying, right? It has, it has um, root chakra capabilities. It creates endurance. The Incan Empire, the Incan warriors lived on maca as one of their staples okay. for thousands of years. So nowadays, the awareness around food and the purity of food and the nutritional value of food is becoming much more into the consciousness of yes. more and more people. So people are including superfoods in their diets. And what you do mainly with these foods is maybe create smoothies. Most everyone understands what a smoothie is, where you take a whole different things and blend them in the blender. Mm -hmm. So many of our products lend themselves very well to be added to smoothies. And now we're developing products. You know, I'm eating, I'm eating our raw trail bar. So we took many of the superfoods and we included it with uh, raw sunflower seeds, raw pumpkin seeds, raisins, almonds, oats, all in their raw form, mm -hmm. unprocessed, and combined it with maca, leucoma, cordyceps mushroom powder. So we combined it with several of the superfood powders to come up with what we think is the most amazing endurance raw trail bar that you can buy. So I have one of these. You do. So on my next run, um, I would better able to tell on a longer run than a shorter run? What I'll do is I'll give you a case of those. I would imagine if you had one bar, could you really notice? I mean, what's your bar of choice? If you, let's say you eat a cliff bar. Cliff bar, power bar, yeah. If you were eating a cliff bar one day and do this the next day, 
I don't know if you would really notice a difference. It would be interesting for someone like yourself, who probably processes food pretty efficiently, mm -hmm. to see the difference. One of the things I think you will notice is that there are no chemicals, there are no preservatives, there is no, right, honey is the sweetener, there's no processed sugars. So I would think that this bar, when eaten more regularly, could very, very well be a wonderful sustaining bar. As well as we have a superfood chocolate, which has maca and cordyceps mushrooms. And so what we're trying to do now is we're going to develop a line of superfoods that people can bring with them very easily. And instead of relying on Power processed, chemical-filled, any chemicals. Okay. So this is all natural, all raw. And, and so we're going to be introducing yeah, a this new line be easy, of Yeah, this would be easy to carry on the trail. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So... Um, are we, you have to go to a health food store to get this stuff or do you, or I know we have your name and your email on the uh, program. How would people, well, first of all, why should people purchase this? What is this going to do? I mean, I'm a runner, so I'm interested. Uh, be, per, people ought to consider superfoods as part of their diet because it can help them move away from processed foods, uh, which may have ingredients in it that simply aren't healthful. Uh, it provides a significant amount of high density nutrition, so you can find yourself eating less. The preparation of superfoods occurs in minutes. There is no cleanup to speak of. It's simpler, but I think the main reason why people ought to consider superfoods in their diet is because it has immune enhancing capabilities. It has um, for, for women, menstrual cycle, it helps smooth out the menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it definitely increases energy and it helps sustain. So for instance, instead of having a cup of coffee in the morning, one might have a superfood smoothie. I have a smoothie every morning and I have a pretty big one and many times that carries me all the way through till dinner. So I find myself eating less, I eat more efficiently and my body is fully sustained. And mm -hmm. I think that superfoods provides an avenue to get higher level of sustenance in simpler foods, certainly raw and unprocessed. And superfoods are becoming more and more assimilated into the marketplace. So it's all packaged? Yeah, we, well, we, you can get it in bulk, you can get it, we have it in the packages. In, in Auburn, uh, Sunrise Natural Foods carries many of our products. Gaia's Basket right here in downtown Auburn carries many of our products. Um, Gaia's Basket is a wonderful solution downtown for all types of natural and organic food. Where's, where's that located? It's located right on the central square. Okay. Right okay. in the central square of Auburn, just okay. adjacent to the Wells Fargo and across from Tango Yogurt. Okay. okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, Briar Patch Co-op up in Nevada City carries our products. Uh, and then there's all over New Moon, New Moon Naturals up in Truckee and Tahoe City, Great Basin Food Co-op in Reno, Placerville Food Co-op. Yeah, so there there are many. We have about 150 different stores. We have okay. a website that one can go to brightearthfoods.com. So would you recommend they go to the website or they go to the store? Well, I would think if they're in town, they just go to the store. Just go to the yeah, store. Yeah, and patronize the store and uh, find out what other goodies they can get from the store. Most of the stores that carry our product have a wonderful line of products that are going to represent the higher end of, mm -hmm. of health and wellness, I would, I would think. That's one, of the, that's one of the beautiful things about my whole life's journey is now I'm involved in something where I can take the skills that I've learned that may have nothing to do with food necessarily, but now I'm heavily involved in managing a company that provides goodness and provides health and well-being. Yeah, I, I believe, yeah, in, in the world of real estate, I really questioned. You know, at some point I got to the point where I was just helping the rich get richer, and, and that weighed on me. That was one of the reasons why I had a difficult transition. Um, and now with this, it's very satisfying. It's very gratifying. And I still don't know 
nearly as much as a lot of people do about the foods themselves. And I am learning constantly. Mm -hmm. My wife, Mary, has an extraordinary understanding of superfoods and nutrition. She's involved in helping to develop new products. Uh, the folks up in Ashland, Jacob Schrader is our general manager. He sources these things. Ander on Martel in Peru. We have a, a group of people that help educate us on this. So let's and, say uh, that let's say that a person wants to get started making a change. Where do they go to find that information? Well, that's a great what, great question. You can simply go onto the web and Google superfoods, or you, you can find all types of information on the web. There are a number of large companies that have websites, and pretty much all of them have information on the individual products. You can go to our website or go to Gaia's Basket and buy the superfood smoothie mix. We combine 17 different superfoods in one bottle. Okay. You just simply open the bottle, take a couple tablespoons, add a banana, add water, blend it up, and there you have 17 superfoods all done. So one of the things that we're working on is superfoods made simple. So if you look at all these individually, you wonder what to do. So we're now working on a line of products okay. that will make it easy. So we're working on an immune balancing blend. We're working on an endurance blend. We're working on a libido enhancing blend. We're working on a stress management blend. All that have different types of Ayurvedic okay. herbs, Chinese herbs, and superfoods combined in a way that will speak to different parts of your physiology. Okay, well, that is something. To say, the, to, say, to say the least. There's a lot so more. We, there's a lo well, there is a lot more. Unfortunately, we only have seconds left of the, oh, there we of, go. Of the program. How quickly it goes by. How quickly it goes by, and you just started with this. Allie, God, I thought you guaranteed me 10 stories. That was only like three or four. You'll have to come back. Oh, wow. Okay. You can come we'll back. We'll have to go on a run. We'll have to go. We'll have a to long go, run. We'll have to go on a long run. Maybe a long, slow run. Doesn't matter. Can't get winded, you know, if we're going to talk. Doesn't matter. Okay. Doesn't matter. We'll 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 do that. Well, I want to thank you for coming coming on the show, Jerome, and sharing um, a little bit of your story. Because your stories are good, and you are good, and and uh, um, you are in a better place and a very different place today than you were ten years ago when yeah. you were in that corporate world and making money hand over fist, as the expression goes. So. So this is neat, and especially good to give, give back, and that's what you're doing. I believe in some ways. I'm, I'm gonna, as I turn 50 next month, I'm definitely contemplating how I can do that in a more robust and consistent way. Well, you, sure. you you are do, you are doing that, so that's that's pretty neat. Well, thank you for joining us.